Here with Matt Denny, head coach Castile High School. Uh, we met at Chandler Gilbert. You brought the whole team over for the Barnstormers there. So, Matt, thanks for jumping on with me. Yes, sir. Thank you. I, you know, I was really impressed with you when you had your whole team over there and could just tell, you know, you're used to developing a championship culture. But just talk about that a little bit with developing a championship culture with your team. Yeah, um, you know, this is my this was my third year there. We had uh, the first year I got there, we had the COVID year. So um, that was a really, really good group. And, and not just talent wise, but just leadership. There was a lot of pieces to kind of build off of. And I was kind of banking on that season to kind of be my cornerstone season for the guys the following year to, you know, to follow because there was all the pieces that that, uh, that you need for leadership and championship culture like we're talking about. But um, unfortunately, that got cut short, just like everybody, I'm sure. Um, and then just kind of rebuilding and and going from there this year and last year is a little bit different. We started six, sometimes seven freshmen uh, last year and um, started seven sophomores this year. So, you know, as far as like cleaning towards cleaning towards leadership and things like that, there was some guys that had to step up a little bit sooner than than expected. Um, our seniors did a good job of, of that. Um, but I think just the championship culture, in my opinion, is just, you know, it's not just game days or tournament days and, there really is a, a mindset from, you know, the day after we lose and they tell us to stop playing, you know, we got to kind of regroup and and try to do things differently than other people. And to be honest, uh, in, in our in our world, you know, there's just outstanding programs everywhere around. So it's you got to go above and beyond to try to create that um, that culture. And and I think um, just having high expectations is a big deal, too. You know, that's any program that I'm coaching in, I don't, you know, we've had years where we're not supposed to be around and years that we are supposed to be there, but the goal is always, um, you know, to, to be there at the end. And that's an expectation that, that doesn't change. And so that's a big part of it, but just trying to get better every day, summer, fall, you know, lifting and things like that. How do you bring those young guys along? I mean, especially young guys that maybe have to play varsity and, and how are you bringing those young guys along? Yeah, you got to be a little patient with them sometimes. You know, the, the goal is when you start those guys early on in the year, you know, we, we don't necessarily have to be ready in February, March, but making sure that they're ready in May, you know, late May and, and making making a run. Um, they're pretty physical freshmen and they're pretty mature freshmen. That's that's a big deal. There's a difference between, I think, being varsity ready and being varsity ready for the program that you're in. Um and I've had years where I've had to have some freshmen play varsity that weren't varsity ready. Um, these guys were were more in the category of, of being ready to play varsity baseball at a high level. Um, our schedule this year didn't, you know, make it easier. We had one of, if not the toughest schedules in Arizona. Um, and so just being patient with them and knowing that, you know, they're used to having a ton of success, obviously. You know, we joke around that, you know, 12 months ago they were playing at 54, you know, 54 feet bases at Cactus Yard Stadium. And now they're, you know, playing against guys that look like grown men. And and because of their maturity, there are times where I have to kind of check myself and even talk to my assistants and say, hey, we got to be patient with, you know, they're going to have these bruises. Um, it's going to pay off at some point. But um, they do a really good job of, of staying confident and making sure they're ready for the next next challenge and keeping their eyes in front of them, you know, instead of behind them. How are you handling the weight room? Uh, so we lift three days a week during the season, um, and we'll go. We lift at six a.m. Uh, we actually have a, a baseball class, a couple baseball classes, but our varsity has last hour baseball class. So instead of using some of those days um, in the weight room and a couple days on the field, we actually lift at six a.m. and then they use the entire class period for development. Um, you know, different different stages throughout the year. You know, depends on what we're doing, uh, but it's it's a definitely an advantage to have that uh, year round. And then in the summer, we have two different groups. We have a high school group and um, two different two different groups there, younger and older, and they lift at different times. And um, yeah, baseball specific stuff and just making sure they're right. And a lot of injury prevention stuff, things like that. What are your favorite injury prevention go tos? Um, a lot of knee stuff, obviously, and shoulder. Uh, we've been lucky to not have very many knee injuries. Um, you know, there's a lot of different shoulder exercises. We have a certified strength and conditioning coach on, on campus. Um, just got a new one 
uh, just recently, but the last guy did a really good job with preventing injuries. Um, you know, injuries that you can control, I guess. We, we had some silly ones this year, um, collisions and things like that. But as far as just arm injuries, we haven't had uh, very many of them. A lot of band work um, and um, things like that. What are your go-tos then in the classroom? I mean, when you're laying out, uh, when you're laying out the calendar for the whole year in the classroom, yeah. like, how are you, I mean, that's, that's awesome. They got it the whole year. So how are you yeah. laying out the whole calendar for your classroom sessions? And I love the classroom sessions. Yeah, no, it's great. We have three different classes. So we have a, basically a freshman baseball class, JV and varsity. Um, I'll talk specifically on the varsity because freshman JV is a little bit different, but the varsity, um, basically in July, when we get back to school, we kind of um, regroup we talk about some things that need to be replaced um, just reiterate some of the holes that we're missing and talk to some guys on where we think they are on the depth chart right this second and what they're striving for um, I'm very transparent with that uh, and sometimes that's good sometimes it's bad but it's it's real talk you know this is why you can't didn't play last year and this is why you know this is things that you're going to have to do right now to um, step in and play for us and so kind of have some meetings there we don't really throw in july very much we'll go out and hit a little bit and everything at this point is kind of what we call the evaluation stage you know we're coaching of course but we're letting them eat a little bit doing their stuff and kind of seeing seeing what kind of summer they had with their other teams um you know and kind of doing that when we get into august so that's about two weeks uh august we meanwhile we're lifting the whole time but in august we um start uh, throwing a little bit more. Um, usually in the mil- middle of August, we'll do our pitchers and catchers kind of report a little earlier and they'll go through some of their work and talk about our, you know, what we want to do on the mound as far as mentality and different things like that. Uh, and then September we're, we're kind of back at it and that's three days a week with the whole program. And we're Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, depending on, and we're kind of ramping up for the, the fall um, season, I guess we don't do a lot as far as, um, so, like summer and fall ball. It's really kind of scrimmage based. You know, we play some teams around here, some pickup games, a couple tournaments, but, um, it's really about getting ABs and just kind of being around the guys and kind of forming that new bond with the new, new group. So we'll do that. Um, in September, we do a lot of individual work. So we'll have the first two weeks of September will be, um, just, like I'll be with the primary meaning like if the primary in that first two weeks is offensive stuff, I'll be in the cage and we'll be videoing some stuff and doing some video analysis with guys. We'll hit one day and then review the video the next day uh, or later that day, uh, kind of go through the whole thing. After I've seen the evaluation part that, that three weeks before, now I can say, okay, this guy needs to do these types of things to get better. This guy needs to do this. And so they have an idea of what to work on when we do get on the field live and we're going, you know, a little bit heavier with that. Um, end of September, we start putting in a little bit more game type situations where we're kind of mixing speeds and changing it up and being, uh, you know, a little tougher on them as far as more real feel in a game. Um, and then early October is when we start to kind of inter-squat each other a little bit. Uh, we'll have some simulated uh, rounds of BP in the cage and, um, we're pretty hot with that stuff. We get pretty heavy with that. And I try to create a really, um, you know, competitive environment. There's a little bit of trash talking going on and things like that. So we're, we're ready to rock and roll when, when middle of October, when the, when the season starts. I was impressed when you guys came over cause it was November and you know, not knowing any of that, you could tell you guys had been around each other. I mean, how long did it take you to develop your team BP session? Cause it was tremendous. Um, that's uh that's something I've been doing for quite a while. I got that I cannot remember the, the the clinic I was at and they were doing I forgot what they called it even, but they were doing a type of BP like that. Um and I me as a player, I was never I was never the most talented hitter. Um I had to take a ton of pride in my defense. I had to take a ton of pride in my first pitch and my instincts and you know, all of those types of things. And so at a young age, like I just I just really like when I went to go take ground balls, I was just like, there's not a ball that's going to get past me. And that was kind of like my, 
my MO because I had to, you know, I wasn't going to hit three doubles in a game and erase the two errors that I made, you know? So it was, to me, that was so important. And I remember looking back as a player and, and thinking like, man, if I could just get like four other guys to put in the effort that I'm putting in right now, we'd be pretty good defensively, you know? Um, and it's just more fun that way for me. It's, it's, I think that that's a, I think obviously we're getting a lot out of that. Um, but I try to look at it and say, okay, why I don't want the right fielder. We don't call it shag ever. You know, I don't want a right fielder shagging. You know, that's a waste of time. Even if a ball is hit to left center, get your two steps, get back in. And what I realized over the course of time, I really didn't realize until probably my junior and senior in college is I started reading pitches a lot better too, because of my pre pitch. Like I was moving to the hole, you know, the, the, up the middle when that pitch was away a little bit, because every single time, you know, instead of just standing around and getting the play that was hit to me. Um, and so that was great. And then offensively, you know, there's many guys, as we know, like, you know, five o'clock hitters and they can go out there and just crank it up. And, and that's great. You know, we like those guys for sure. But uh, again, I think rewarding good baseball players and not good BP hitters is the, it was the goal of what we're trying to do. You know, I, I might have my second baseman who doesn't have any kind of power, but if he can, you know, use the whole field. And especially when we go infield in and he's, you know, hitting line drives up the middle, that's creating confidence for him. And he's getting rewarded, you know, not just going four for five and around with four doubles. Um, and it's competitive as hell. Like that's the other thing too. You know, it's when you have teams like that, drafting is strategic. You know, that's part of the thing that we didn't see in that on that Saturday or whatever. We sometimes I'll pick the four worst players. Sometimes I'll pick the four best players and they know the rules and they know what they're trying to do. So, it's very uh, competitive on who they're who they're going after, and you know there's guys that get snubbed, and you can see it on their face. Like, wait, what? What do you mean I'm the, you know, sixth pick? And then they got a little extra juice when it's when it's go time to prove people wrong. So it, it definitely, you know, you can do it too much, but it's it's probably a once a week type of way, uh, the way we did it that day. Um, and then every day is charting, and every day is you get, you get minus points. For defense. Sorry, hold on one second. I apologize. It's all right. Okay. Awesome. They're like my dogs. <laughs> That's a good thing with the editing equipment. Like Lock them something. outside. I <laughs> uh, love it. That's the same thing as our dogs. They're a yeah. mess. That's why I record my office and not a, not a hole. Hey, who got yeah. you in a video review? I mean, when, when, when's the first time as a player you saw yourself? Um, we had, you know what, we, to be honest, when I was in college, there wasn't a lot of that. Um, we just started doing a little bit of it and it was so big for me because I, I I'm terrible with self analyzing and, and self correcting. Like same with my golf game, you know, I'll have a buddy that'll be like, Hey, you're, you're this, you're doing this. And I'll look at him like, you're, you're nuts. There's no way I'm doing that. You know? So my feel versus real was never, never good. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't do it. Um, and so we started doing that really it was to, to be honest, it was to prove hitters wrong. A lot of times hitters will say to me, coach, I'm not doing that. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, you, you trust me, but a lot of times they don't, you know, and then you show them that and they kind of make this look like, Oh my gosh, you know, that's what it is. And then, you know, so that's a big part of it. The AIA used to not let you record, um, anything in game. And now that they do, like we iPad pretty much every single game, um, from the chess side, we also, video probably once a week or more if they ask for it um and then again a lot of times in that you know that fall stage that i was talking about for those two or three weeks where that's pretty much all we're doing um is video and that but i think it's a huge huge help i mean we're not like crazy technology and we don't have a lot of the other things you know the blast motion or you know things like that um but we're we're definitely looking into getting some video on both sides of the dugout instead of just using the ipad here, here in the near future is there a common flaw that you see with your high school guys or is it different for everybody? Um, I mean, what, what are the things that are sticking out usually when it's like, okay, that looks like it's supposed to look or, Hey, that might need some cleaning up. Yeah. I think um, for us, we have a, a little bit of a different, I, I mean, it's, it's actually becoming more popular now, but we, you know, the old school swing down on the ball and all the stuff that, you know, we were taught when we played and things like that. It's changed quite a bit. And you know, we're, we're trying to do things a little bit differently. And I think there, if you don't spend a lot of time on it, kids are swinging straight uphill, 
And, you know, we do want them to work a little bit uphill at times, depending on the situation. And I think that's one of them is they, they tend to just kind of, you know, the old school drop your shoulder, which, you know, whatever it's you can get technical with all that. But really the biggest thing for us is when guys start to lose their barrel and their, their barrels dragging behind because they're, they're not, um, you know, using their backside properly. That's probably the biggest one. Um, and then we talk a lot about our lines and our direction and what we're trying to do as a hitter. Um, you know, guys tend to fly open a lot more than uh, they should. And they think that when you get a pitch that's middle in, yes, you're supposed to hit it to left field. But, you know, if their barrel's going all the way to left field, then then obviously we're getting a lot of bad spin. Um, the, a lot of the drills that we do in the cage um, – and our prep work is concentrated strictly on spin. Um, are we getting top spin? That's no good. Are we getting hook spin or slice spin? Um, and it, it takes a little while to educate them on what causes those. But once you once you teach them, you know what why you're getting that kind of spin. The goal is for them to fix that after two. You know, so and we use this a lot in our program where it's you know if you hook a ball once, okay, that happens. If you hook a ball again, you should there should be some kind of alarm going off that that's not okay. And then, you know, a third one, there should be something like <laughs> glaring to you um, and then just over adjust and make that adjustment. So you're not, you know, making that same thing. But I think direction and I think that back, that, that bat kind of losing your barrel are the two biggest ones that we try to fix. Any other things in the cage that you like doing that maybe some other teams aren't doing? Um, I love short, short bat work. I know a lot of guys do that. We, we, probably do it more with both hands um short hand short bath with both hands just to just for connection i think it cleans up a lot of you know if you're around the ball or you're not clean clean path to the ball it's really magnified with that short bat you swing and miss or hit it off the end a lot more um we have our machine setup is is in there daily and so we'll at the beginning of the fall we'll do a lot of just takes like curveball takes and left-handed right-handed takes and just seeing it in um, without even taking a swing and just visualizing some things. I think that helps to prep you for, for when that happens. Um, but no, I, I don't think there's anything crazy in there that we, that we do. Um, well, just that. I mean, that's a college is, is taking pitches yeah. early to get into a good rhythm before you have to add swing decisions in, you know, when yeah. they're only focused on one thing, which is just seeing the ball, the ball is going to be bigger from them for a visual standpoint because they don't have yeah. that swing decision in there cognitively. So it just allows them to see the ball better and then also track where the ball is coming in in relation to their body too. It just cleans a lot of things up. For sure. We have – we use the machine a lot. Um, and to be honest, I think this year we started getting to it. And th this was a learning experience for me. We, we used a little too much this year, I think, to where it got us to a point where it was like, we were in swing mode no matter what. So the reason we used the machine was like, we want to create that spin rate. You know, there's some big arms and who we played. And um, again, if you lose the barrel behind you off the machine, you're going to just fillet everything or slice it in the, the cage. Um, and so this really helped us, I guess, stay more on top of the fastball and not get beat, you know, at the top of the zone. Um, but at the same time, the machine doesn't throw very many balls. And so it's just swing and swing and swing, you know, so we kind of had to get, get away from that um, a little bit towards the middle of the season just to get a better feel. You know, sometimes you're throwing BP and it gets stuck a little bit and it's, you know, a, a tick lower than it was or taking a pitch that's not a good pitch, you know. So uh, actually a couple of my players came to me and said, Coach, I think, you know, I want to see some live arm a little bit more. And and uh, part of me was like, no, this is what we do. You know, and then I'm thinking, well, maybe, you know, to be honest, I think it kind of saved our season offensively. We, we went back into doing – live arm, you know, three or four times a week and, and doing some other stuff with the machine, but we'll still use it pretty heavy in the fall. You're mixing live arm when they're saying it, are you changing speeds and, and trying to get them out with live arm? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we have, we have different days of BP where we have what we call feel good BP. And then a lot of days on BP, if there's a star next to the BP, that means it's not a feel good, you know, lace them up a little tighter because we're going to try to beat you a little bit. Um, and to be honest, those days I, I like a lot, um, sometimes it feels like, man, we're, we're struggling a little bit offensively, but I use that as much for hitting technique as I use it for body language and find out, you know, who my dogs are and, and which guys are going to kind of pucker up and kind of say, this is, this is too hard. This isn't fun or whatever. So well, the game's hard and then the game. Yeah, hard. no doubt. No doubt. <laughs>
no doubt. Who inspired yeah, you to get into coaching? Um, to be honest, my my uh, childhood wasn't like I didn't have a super supportive parent structure. Um, kind of messed up in that regard, and so my father figures, my you know mentors were my coaches. Um, didn't have a lot. I didn't have money to pay for things, and they did, and didn't you know. Luckily, I was decent enough to to have them kind of support me in that way. But just I was always wanted to be around the game. You know, I didn't I didn't always like to go home and hang out. It was like stay at the field, go outside and shoot, you know, whatever sport it was. It was just constantly um, being competitive. And and to be honest, like they that group of coaches around that time, you know, 13 to 18 kind of saved me uh, going to the right path. And so now it's kind of a pay it forward type of thing. Um, I always knew I wanted to do something in, um, in baseball. And I kind of realized senior year, junior, senior year, that it wasn't going to be playing professionally. And so switched my major and, and started to, uh, go down that coaching route. So who'd you lean on early when you were a young coach? Um, Jerry Dawson, he's a longtime coach at Chaparral high school. He, I asked him for advice a lot, um, there's uh, Ryan Holtorf, who was the head coach at Greenway High School when I took over, was my mentor. He coached me um, as a kid and, and kind of kept me in the game and then kind of went up and learned a lot from him early on. Um, Scott Richardson has been a humongous help. I've coached the Sunbelt team with him and have a really good relationship with him and kind of lean on him for advice on on some things. They've had some, you know, experience in that way. But to be honest, like – it. Anywhere I can, I can ask is um, I'm getting it from, you know, I'll look around. I'm always trying to better our program. So I'll just like all of us, you know, we'll steal stuff and ABCA and AZVCA and all those things, you know, try not to completely copy them. You know, I might take something and say, Hey, this would be cool if we did X, Y, or Z. But um, those guys that I leaned on, those, those guys I mentioned were just invaluable. You know, they gave me some really, really good advice, uh, my first year of coaching that I've been able to stay behind, you know, for 20 years now. So when was your first year coaching the Sunbelt team? Uh, that would have been 2000. Uh, I think 2012. Yeah. I think still, it's amazing. It's still going. Yeah. They actually this year, unfortunately got canceled. The Sunbelt got canceled. The, uh, there's a couple teams that a couple States had to back out cause their season got bumped back for COVID, but um, yeah, it is, it is a great tournament. Um, we're, we're taking that same Sunbelt team from Arizona this year and taking them to Louisiana for a big tournament there. So hopefully we'll stay in, stay in touch with that Sunbelt group. How do you balance what's best for the player and, and what's best for the program? Yeah, we, we have a thing in our program. I tell the parents and I'm very upfront with this. Uh, we will do what's best for the program first. Um, so if you always do what's best for the program first, there are going to be, you know, some players that, might not be in the best situation. Um, but in the long run, I think that helps the player uh, a lot of times just as much. Uh, there's always this question that's asked, like, what's better, development or winning? And it, I just have never understood that. I think by developing, you, you are doing that. Um, you know, we're not going to sacrifice getting somebody hurt or to win a game or anything like that. But I just think they go hand in hand. I think every single day, you know, being creative with your training plan and being, you know, competitive and and that's all developing you know a lot of times they'll i'll talk about like postseason play and that that stuff starts right now you know we were talking about being competitive every day i i think i see a lot of teams in the playoffs that kind of flip a switch that say oh it's playoff time and you know we, it's like we we take it, a lot of pride it's too late at that point yeah. it's too yeah. late you had a lot of reps to get in to get ready for yeah. that point you can't just no, do it no now. doubt no doubt. And I, and I, and I do see that, you know, there's the, we played this team in, you know, March and now we're playing them again. And now it's like WWF over there. And before it wasn't, you know, but that's just, that's part of obviously, I think trying to, trying to make sure they're ready in May, just always being competitive and whether that's catch play, whether that's BP, you know, individual D, whatever it is. When is your first parent meeting? So we have a parent meeting in February. Um, that's, uh, the Monday after we make the team, uh, that discusses all the stuff in, in spring. And then we'll do another uh, parent meeting at the beginning of the summer. And that's basically for the new parents to kind of tell them, here's what we're expecting. Here's the things that do not do this. And, you know, 
stay out of the dugout and things like that, just so they know, you know, coming from an eighth grade or a travel team to us, it's a little bit different. We send it out to our college parents. I sent them a letter before the season. We didn't meet with them face to face, but I sent a letter preseason on what their expectations were during the spring. Yeah, just, no to, doubt. just, to, just to get it out of the way because I just didn't yeah. want to not cover it and then have to address it in season. I'm like, I'm sure they're like, what is this? But I'm like, yeah. I just want to get it out in the open. And then that way, if they had questions, they could come talk to me about that too. Just, I think you got to lay people's expectations out for them. Yeah, for sure. And we talk a lot about, you know, like you said, expectations. There's there's a number of things that are non-negotiable in our program. Like if, if they're not literally sprinting out to the position, especially in the summer and the fall, someone goes and gets them and they come back in and, you know, I had parents complain years ago about it. And I, the explanation is I, you know, we, your son made that call. Like this decision for me is made a long time ago. They're, you know, so they all know the expectations. They know, you know, little Johnny's not going to need a blue Gatorade in the third inning. He's going to be just okay if he has to wait or get it to him before and things like that. But their parents are great. You know, here at Castile where I am there, it's been, it's been phenomenal, very supportive and, they get it for me sprinting on and off was injury prevention for them I know Arizona weather is different than the Midwest but for me it was injury present prevention like you only have a limited amount of time of sprinting on and off and if you don't do that and you haven't sprinted in a while and you got to sprint the bases the likelihood of pulling a hammy or blowing about like that that goes up so for me it was injury for prevention sure. for sure yeah for sure that and we you know one of the it, for us, it's a cornerstone. I mean, we have coaches talk about how we do it, and man, you guys really—I can't get my guys to do that. It's, yes, you can. It, it, it yes, you starts can. right now. Yes, yeah, you, you can. can. It starts in June. It starts when it's hot. You know, we had a game this morning, and and there's guys that they they just know that. You know, my thing is you're going to make tough outs, and if you can drop that in the dugout and sprint out, then that's unselfish. Then that means you're still for us. You know, if you're a cool guy and you jog out there with your batting gloves half in, and you walk out there you're saying that it's more important than, than the team. That's just how I've always, I've always done it, you know, and that's, I think it's intimidating too. There's kind of a relentless pressure when you got nine guys running past, you know, somebody to come in a, that's saying we are ready to hit like right now, let's go hit and same thing defensively. You got guys sprinting out there as a hitter. You're like, man, these guys are more than ready. And whether it's consciously or subconsciously, I think it does put a little pressure and, and, kind of a, a hold on on the other team it's body language it's flushing bad performance you know if you made an air sprint it off into the dugout same thing if you had a tough at bat sprint it off it helps body language helps reset get ready for the next thing yeah, there's no so doubt. many benefits to it hey so. because you got you got a lot of season with guys fall spring summer how are you handling downtime with them and they may, maybe on ramp to get ready with the amount yeah, of so- volume so our off-season stuff is June only. We'll finish in Huntington Beach in July, uh, first week in July, finish like the third. Um, I encourage and promote all of our guys to do travel ball stuff. Uh, we usually carry bigger rosters because of that. Uh, I want them hearing a different voice. Uh, I want them to really, to be honest, show off kind of being a Castile baseball player. You know, um, so I started this about 10 years ago. Basically, they don't come to me and say, hey, coach, I have a – club game, I'm going to be there. I tell the parents, I tell them it's the player's responsibility to communicate, but that, that conversation doesn't go like that. That conversation is, Hey coach, I have two games. I have a conflict. Which one would you want me to go to? 99% of the time I'm telling them to go do their thing um, outside. Uh, There probably is a little bit better competition because we're just scrimmaging local teams here. Um, But also, you know, you got the, the backup shortstop that, didn't get a lot of time that thinks he deserves time. And sometimes they prove me right in the summer. Like, man, this guy can do that. Or sometimes it's hey, when you got your chance, you know, you had two, two errors or you sprayed it on the mound or whatever, you know, you, you just, this is ammo for me. Like, this is why you're there. Not nothing wrong with it. This is what we got to get better at. Um, it also gives some, I call them sub leaders. It gives like the, not the alpha dogs, but the other ones a chance, like, looking around and seeing like the four best guys not there. Okay. I'm the best guy now. And so gives them a little bit more leadership quality. Um, so we do that in June. We don't play again until October, November, and pretty much the same thing We're you know, that's a big time showcase out here in Arizona in October. And so during the week we use for our pitchers, they use their weekly outing as a bullpen one inning, and then they pitch their, you know, competitive innings on the weekend. Um, 
and that's just kind of how we've how we've done that. When do they have time for bullpens? During class. Yeah, we'll throw bullpens during class. And then that two weeks when we come back where they report a little early, well, they'll throw some bullpens there. Um, if they don't get their mid inning, you know, sometimes we don't have games during the week. So they'll throw uh, if they're not throwing with their club team, they'll throw there. If they are going to throw on their club team, then that's when we do our simulated BP um, in the cage and have them work through that. How are you? How are you setting up your simulations? Are they just going at it straight counts? Are you mixing in situations? How are you doing simulations? Yeah, we do. We do a few different ways. Um, sometimes we'll just go straight up. You know, pitcher's going to throw thirty pitches, and we have five guys cycle in, and we're in an OO count. And if they hit the first pitch, you know, then that's their at bat, and they just go through their at bats, um, and the pitchers will dictate that. Sometimes we'll we'll do two strike simulation where the pitchers are really only working on two strike pitches. Um, out pitches and the hitter will try to survive, you know, three pitches. If they do a great job, even if they don't get a hit um, different, that's probably the two bigger ones. Um, rarely, sometimes we'll do a hit and run, but that's usually on the field. Um, yeah. It's tough in the and, cage. Cause you can't see ball flight. Yeah. It's so hard yeah. to execute hit and run. I mean, if they get it down, that's like, well, where to go. And so uh, that's, right. that's a hard yeah. thing with, I want to see it on the field, especially with the defense, just to give them a better visual, but, um, that's pretty much how we do it. A lot, you know, early on it's basketball only. And so that's, that's my favorite one because you know, you're not getting fooled. You, you know, you better don't take fastballs, even if it's not the fastball, you know, if there's a fastball in the zone, let's get on it. Um, and so that's, you know, mono a mono pitcher versus hitter. And that's, you know, they start talking at lunch a little bit about what's going to happen at, at two 30 and see what that, you know, that looks like. But I, I like that environment. Actually, we're probably gonna do a little more of that this year than, we, we have in the past when you when you're layering in off speed pitches then for pitchers usually not until that third week they'll they'll go some bullpens early and then we'll kind of ramp them up after that after that third week um being able to do that we um in the fall and the summer for a lot of the newer pitchers we have we have rules where they they can't throw a breaking ball unless they get two strikes and so um, the younger pitchers for sure we do this with i want them to get outs with fastballs if you can't throw a fastball to get ahead, then you can't pitch for us anyway. And so they're allowed to throw one change up or one curveball when they get to two strikes. So yeah, I think what it does is it's like, okay, if I don't, if I throw a ball on this pitch, then I can't throw a curveball until pitch four, no matter what. So it really helps them kind of get ahead. And what I think is interesting is many times when you do that, instead of the traditional 0 2 1 2 breaking ball every time, you know, guys are hopefully learning and saying, hey, I've already beat this guy twice with my fastball. I don't think I even need to do that. So let's try to go off the plate in a little bit just as effective. Um, I think some, that's something, at least in Arizona, that pitchers do not do a very good job of. And That's all a over the country, points. not being able to yeah. pitch inside. It's bad. I mean, it's it's such a tough pitch, pitch to hit, and guys don't like it, you know, and getting under their hands. And it's, uh, it's definitely, you know, I've talked to my staff a little bit. It's definitely something we're going to try to – try to, you know, do a little bit more of and get better at. Because I see, I, I mean, literally, I see the teams that pitch inside all the time. And sometimes they're not good arms, you know. I mean, great arms, but immediately become a good arm if you can throw inside um, in high school. So Some of the best soft toss and lefties I ever had were, could throw inside, just to keep you honest. And then that way, you know, hitters are going to talk. We talked about, I talked about this at the California Community College Championship. Early on, try to bust somebody in because hitters are going to talk going back to the dugout. Well, he's throwing me inside. He's throwing me inside. And so you just set him up for later in the game when you have to finish him off away. It just yep. pitcher, hitters are going to talk. Well, you told me he wasn't going to pitch away. He threw one inside. And then they're looking for the yep. inside pitch. It just opens everything back up for you. Yeah, for sure. We use dummies. We have, you know, the, the bullpen dummies that we try to use. Catchers don't love that when I'm trying to push, you know, a guy to – hit inside and it's hitting off the plastic thing and stuff like that. But yeah, we're, we're definitely going to brainstorm some other ways to, to do that um, for sure. Cause I think it's, I think it's a huge weapon. How great is it in the area that you're in for high school, junior college, college, and also professional baseball. It's unbelievable. The, the, what you have access to there. It is. These guys have no idea how lucky they are. You know, all the scouts that live here in Arizona, um, there's now three big division one programs that, that all, you know, are, are good. Um, you know, and especially where we are like Queen Creek Chandler area, there's just, you know, we're in the, the hot hotbed of, 
talent and good coaching and, and things like that. They're always able to play a competitive game year round. Um, so it, it is a huge thing. Obviously the weather's great, but I think people don't realize too, like not only is the weather perfect, but like the ground is so much harder here in Arizona too. Like, you know, we go back to Oklahoma for the Sun Belt and guys are hitting, you know, what they think are missiles in the six hole and they're getting gobbled up by the third baseman because the grass is so much thicker and, you know, air is thicker and things like that. So thin air, hard ground, like it's a, it's a huge advantage uh, to play in Arizona, no doubt, no doubt. Do you have a fail forward moment? Do you have something you thought was going to sidetrack you, but looking back now is one of the best things that happened to you? Um, yeah, I think, you know, are you talking about like specifically this season or just anything in general? personal coaching, you know, any, anything that comes to mind? Yeah, um, for sure. I, uh, my, my path to becoming a head coach was, um, kind of strange. I, I got done playing. I started coaching JV baseball right away. Um, I, I might've been 22, I think 21 coached one season there and then went over to the other school, Greenway high school, where I was telling you about Ryan Holtorf. He was the head coach there. Um, and I had three years under my belt as an assistant there. And I was just eager to be a head coach. Like I, I just thought I was ready and applied for a job and was told I got the job. And then a couple days after was, was told I did not get, actually, I wasn't even told that I found out through other people that I didn't get the job. So I really got snubbed kind of unprofessionally. And, and, uh, I was pretty upset about that. And, Looking back shortly after, I, there was so much more that I needed to do and learn. Um, so the next three years, I, I waited another three years to even apply. And that that growth I had in those three years was, you know, I feel like shaped my, my coaching career um, in, in a good way. I think if I, you know, I always would spend the time and have the passion and, and work really hard at what, what I do. But um, I think there was just so many pieces that, you know, maturity wise and everything else that it was just better off, um, waiting. And so then I, I got another job after that three years, um, took the job. And then the coach that I was coaching for left mid year. And so it was really, it was a tough, I'm like, get the job at my alma mater and then have to go, you know, and say, sorry, just kidding. Like, and went back. So it was a, a, a definitely a weird path. And then I spent 16 years at Greenway and it was, it was they, they the administration was great and let me make my mistakes and learn from my mistakes and you know um kind of kind of build the philosophy and everything else that that you know I have right now that three year period I mean what do you feel like got better that that besides maturity what do you feel like got better yeah uh conversations with parents I wasn't ready for that um and and Ryan Holtorf let me handle a lot of that I was the main coach in the summer and the main coach in the fall so I got to do that a little bit um I feel like I had I had a little bit of it, resentment's not the right word but I had a tough time coaching the superstars you know because they're sometimes they don't give as much effort and sometimes they're a little bit you know they almost have to have that alter ego like I'm so good like I can't make mistakes type of stuff and um that kind of bothered me a little bit and I was really hard on that until I was able to kind of deal with that, put my arm around them and say, Hey, you know, your teammates look at you a, a little bit differently than you think and kind of be able to have those conversations. Um, that was a big part of it. Um, I think strategy and just kind of paying more attention to detail as far as the running game and when to do certain situations and things like that. I just got done playing college. So I, you know, I was hesitant to do some of the things that I knew worked at the high school, you know, level. And now, you know, having those three more years, I could say, okay, that doesn't work because of this, this might work better, even though this wouldn't work there, you know, delayed steel is a huge weapon for huge. us. Um, and, it was still huge in college. We used to yeah. sneak it out. I, I loved when the other team would scream out, watch delay. Cause well, you yeah. would still get them every once in a while. Like you would just wait, but there are certain situations where it's just waiting for you. And yeah. Um, yeah, I love yeah. delay. I, I'm i such a big I was, fan of delay. I was taught that uh, my senior year in, in high school, um, and I was not a good runner. You know, I would say literally, I think I had 15 stolen bases and 13 of them were delays, you know. And if you do it the right way, it's – I love what you're talking about. One of my favorite things is the other coach that's yelling at the first baseman, you know, like 
you got to be, let us know. You know, Second that's like, me, I'm like, okay, we're going to be doing that a lot. That was it's a lot be the of time right we here. would spend with the second baseman. I'm like, hey, the, especially the, the high school kids. I'm like, hey, you have a lot to think about over here at second. And delay is one of them, making sure the yeah. middle guy shuffle to the bag. Those yep. are, we just spent so much time on that to defend it, which is why we, we never really got beat by delay at all because we did it. So they were used to seeing it in practice. Yeah. But those were all the small individual defense stuff that we would have to spend time with guys on. Like, hey, I, I know you didn't have to do this before, but there's certain things that you're going to have to do. And your call is is the delay and shuffling your feet to the bag just to make sure. it's That's yeah, a beautiful sure. part of coaching. Yeah, no doubt. And so just learning those little – you know, things that in that three years, I, I, you know, started, start seeing some trends and seeing some things that would work and some deficiencies with our guys that we can exploit with other teams and, you know, things like that. So. What, what about routines? You got any morning or evening routines? I mean, you're in good shape. So do you have morning or evening routines that you go to that you like? No, I mean, we're, we're, um, as far as our team, like no, you, team is you personally, or? I mean, you no, got any I mean, nutrition, I, sleep, or book habits, no, anything that you like that you go to? No, I think obviously during the season, it's more difficult. You know, this is always, I, I feel like for coaches, it's like when the season's over, we're all yelling like, yeah, we're going to get back in shape and we're going to do, you know. Um, and I have three kids and it's crazy busy as well. So just kind of, you know, maintaining that. Plan. Yeah, with that, we're in the trenches for sure, my wife and I. But um, no, I think just staying, I mean, mentally fresh and, and trying to, you know, decompress. You know, I usually do that at night and kind of re recharge and then try to get up early enough to not be rushed in the morning. I think that's a big deal, especially on game days. I'm, I'm usually up 30, 45 minutes earlier than I normally do have, have a coffee, chill out, kind of think about the day and what, you know, plan where we're going to go, how we're going to, how we're going to accomplish the day. Um, I spend a lot of time um, in the morning and on my prep, with training plan. I think that's the most of my day and I try to be, um, unique with it and authentic and make sure it's creative. And, you know, I hate it as a coach, knowing that you're going to go out, you're going to stretch, you're going to, you know, do the 20 ground balls, four rounds of five. You're going to do that first, that second, that third and go home. And so, um, which I think is why like during the season, it's tougher to, you know, go out and run for a little bit or do that. But, Try to get it in whenever you can. When are you send in practice plans out to guys, they don't see it till uh, till it's on the board. So I'll I'll post that when they walk in. That's the first thing they do is they go to the board and see what's today going to look like. You know, and honestly, you could probably video them and tell you if it's something they're going to like or not like. But even on days when they don't like it, it's still it's still you know fun and 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 different. You know, there's a lot of times where they don't know. I mean, there's still things that, that we put on the on the training plan, and I'll put very vague. I'll call it whatever drill, and a lot of them are like, I have no idea what he's talking about, you know. So we have a team meeting at the beginning of the day, and we'll discuss that in detail, like what, what it's going to look like so that we don't have to stop. And, you know, we're usually an hour and 45 minutes, two hours at the most, and it's just go, go, go the whole time. Very efficient. You do youth camps? Yeah, um, we usually do uh, one in the summer and then one in the Christ Christmas time. We're lucky at Castile. We have seventh and eighth grade on campus. So I actually have the eighth graders in baseball class as well. Um, and our my the baseball uh, junior high season here in Arizona and our in our district, they play in the fall. So my head coaches, all four of them are the two coaches for seventh grade and the two coaches for eighth grade. So. You know, that's a huge advantage when you're getting that every day and you're getting varsity instruction throughout that. So if I didn't have that, we would definitely do more youth camps. But because we have them in class for school and the junior high season, it's not as important. Yeah, you have um, a built-in feeder program already. Yeah. And when I when I, when I I do a camp, I really try not to do, you know, a, a rinky dink, I should say, you know, like just get them together and move around and do that. Like I want some some real instruction and video analysis and it, and it does take some time and, and uh, I want to make it worth their while if we do it. So when you're filming, are you filming just from the side or are you filming from behind? Usually we'll go from chest side. Um, and side. then it, if we're yeah open side and anything else that we'll do will be from uh, pitcher view. 
uh, just to see in and out and kind of see path from there. Um, so those are the two places that we, we do the most. I mean, how, how much is it usually just timing of the hitter if it's off just a little bit for guys? A lot. Yeah. Timing's a big part of it. You know, we talked about the lines. Um, you know, if you're early, your line's going to tend to be more to left field and your alignment's going to be off a little bit. Um, I, I really do it a lot for pitch selection. I know there was, we had a kid that we saw in the, in the quarters that was, um, really good arm. And I knew that the spin had to be the spin rate had to be very good because we had so many guys that were taking the pitch that was bottom of the zone, but it was definitely a strike. You know, and my better hitters, I'd go in and ask, like, well, what's up? Why are we, why are we pulling the trigger there? And they look at me in disbelief, like, are you serious? The ball's on the ground, you know? And then I point the iPad and say, take a look. And sure enough, it's above their knees, you know? And so that's a big thing too, is one of the biggest things we look at from the open side or chest side is we'll freeze it and snapshot, you know, right at contact point. And many times, at contact point, they're lunging forward, obviously, which is the timing part of it. Or many times the ball isn't even in the frame. And I'm looking at it and I'll ask him, like, what do you see wrong with this picture? What do you see wrong with this swing? And the ball is like outside of the frame. And they'll they'll make up something. I'm like, okay, well, no, that's pretty good. This is pretty good. Your contact point is legit if the ball was on your bat, but the ball is still, you know, out of the picture. And so we definitely use that for for timing and and mechanics yeah for guys that are way out front how are you fixing how are you how are you helping them with that piece the the generic fix and i think a pro, honestly i think a problem um in my opinion is a lot of guys will say things like way back more or hit the ball to right field more well if the ball is middle in then that's not the answer that's a band-aid it'll work for a little bit but if i'm a pitcher letting go of something middle in that's a good pitch to hit and a guy doesn't blast it in the left center that I feel like that's good for me. Um, and so what we do again, we talk about our lines a little bit. So we, we have a drill, we call it extended T. Um, I think it's a, that's a really bad situation right now where guys will hit off the T and they'll put the T on the plate and they'll try to hit the ball up the middle or even pull the ball. And that contact point, that depth should be something hit over the first baseman's head where they have the T And so they really never get extended through the zone. And so we start up in front of the tee or in front of the home plate, and we just keep moving inch, 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 keep going way, way out in front of us. And a lot of people I've seen them when we do this drill, they look at us like we're crazy because the tee is so far out in front. And the spin of the ball and what happens with it aren't always the best. Um, Our our goal is to not have the hook spin, but many times when we do that extended tee, the ball – is naturally going to go a lot higher. Well, if we stay on that line, then we've extended that early part of our swing. Does that make sense? So we can go out and get it a lot earlier. And many times you'll see kids when they first start, especially the younger guys, they'll swing and it'll just barely tip the ball. And then they'll scoot up to the, to the, to the ball. I said, no, 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 go back to where you were. I put a line in there and I said, you can get to this. Yes. You might hit a little higher, but this is where our bat is trying to stay through longer. You know, because I think many high school guys, their bats in the zone for this long. So they're always going to be early, you know, or they're going to have to just push it in the right field. And so instead of talking about staying back more and things like that, we just try to talk about extending our barrel through the zone a little bit. Um, and yeah, really we used try to, to hit try. into extremes. So we would set it up way behind and we'd set it way out front just to, yeah. to teach them yeah. how long to keep their barrel into the hitting zone and give them a wider berth to, to make contact with. So we used to, sure. we used to work the extremes a lot. Yeah, for sure. And we'll do, you know, we'll, we'll have some rounds where it's kind of interesting. Like if they're early, I won't say like, let's, let's go to right field. I mean, I will every once in a while if it's the right hitter and that's the move, but many times it's, I'll tell them, okay, I want you to be early with this, but I want you to hit it as high as you can to center field. You know, don't, don't hit it as far as you can there. Just hit it as high as you can. And then they start to kind of work back into the left center gap with good spin um, because their barrels just naturally in the zone longer because of it. What type of throwing program? Do you have a pretty strict throwing program for guys with outfield, infield catchers, pitchers? Is it pretty strict or do you let them go with a little throwing program wise? No, we, um, we have a, we have a strict throwing program that we use. It's not like a, regimented um like uh, the first week we're going to go 90 feet the second week we're going to go 120 um we usually start 
the first week at about 90 and then we go to 120 and we go to 150. That's not the part that's structured. You know, I'll have them stretch it out if they need to. Our structure part is I got this from Tyler Gillum at South and I think he might've got it from a couple other guys, but um, infield, you know, there's different stages of, you might've seen it. I mean, a lot of guys use it and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, there's throwing on the run, there's, catch play as far as double play turns in the box back to, you know, um, a lot of we reps to get in that you can make productive. You get a lot of yeah. game reps in doing it that yeah. way. I let them, I let them have, I call it cool guy catch. I'll let them do their cool guy catch at the end, you know, but I want them to work through this, you know, our juniors and sophomores, junior seniors, they already know it. It's very simple. They, they get through it quickly and they're good at it. And again, I think it's also something that when you're playing another team, um, when they're looking over and seeing structured catch play and structured stretch and all that stuff, I think it gives you a little bit of advantage. Um, you know, I, we try to do things, like I said earlier, different. What makes us different? Everyone's taking ground balls. Everyone's taking BP. Like how do we separate ourselves from the, you know, monsters that are in our, in our conference and, you know, right around us. Any tips for your young coaches that are getting into it right now or new coaches doesn't have to be a young coach. It could be a new coach that's getting into it. Yeah, best advice I ever got was was just be consistent with with what you're doing. Like, have a have a plan right now, and stick to that plan no matter what. There's gonna be times where you wanna, you know, you wanna be you wanna be a little bit lenient to a kid because he's your best player and you know he didn't show up to weights, but eh, you know we need him in the three hole. That's that's not gonna that's not gonna bode well at the end. Um, and it's just it's comforting, you know, knowing that rules are this and unfortunately if this doesn't work out for the best player or the worst player that is you know that's going to be how it is all the time you know we've we sat shortstop in semifinal game for missing lifting we've we've done you know at previous schools there's there's consequences for that i i always tell the player i'm going to be here for a long time you might not you're going to be gone in a couple of years like these are these are things that are are not going to not going to waver. And I think that's honestly the best advice I got from Jerry Dawson was don't, don't change any of your, you know, guidelines or rules or protocol for anyone. It's, you know, it doesn't matter. Do you have any other accountability things to do besides just sitting, you know, sitting guys, do you do anything else with them accountability wise? Yeah. I mean, we have some, we have some lifting every once in a while when we got some guys that are missing lifting, we'll, we'll partner them up. And uh, if their partner doesn't show up, they have to run. Um, it's not them. And sometimes that's unfortunate. You know, we do a random draw and there's like certain guys that they're probably like, please don't pick this guy. You know, um, there's that. We have med ball runs where they put a ball over their head and they have to throw it over their head, sprint to the ball and keep doing that. Um, 10, 15 minutes will make them get up a little earlier and get to get to lifting uh, more often. But to be honest, I think if you have good culture, they, they, they kind of police themselves in that regard. You get guys that are a little bit lazy and we're, we're there now with, with Castile. Uh, we're there where it's like, I got a couple other guys, you know, looking at him like, what's up, man? Like we're all, we're all here and you're not, this isn't cool. Like, you know, let's, let's figure this out. Word so. of mouth spreads fast with the players from year to year. Once, once yeah. you get that culture set, like the, yeah. the older guys usually take care of it. Like, Hey, don't, yeah. don't miss. And, or else this is going to happen. <laughs> to really hone in on on the more talented better players obviously i mean we all know like if you're i've had some some really special teams where my best players are the ones that are leading leading the lifting and they're you know that that's when you really go when when you have your best guys that you know everyone's looking around like well if he you know the jordan factor if jordan's winning every sprint and working harder than anybody else and you're not then you're <laughs> you're in the wrong spot you know so. Anything for youth or travel coaches on maybe things you're not seeing that guys need to be more ready for when they show up to you? I think base running is really poor. I think they're I, – I don't know very many teams that – I mean, they might run bases in training practice or whatever. I'm but doing it just, with six-year-olds at youth camp. I'm yeah, doing Scott yeah. Bankhead's youth camp this week, and yeah. I, I'm in charge of base running with all five yeah. groups. Good. So we're, yeah. we're hitting it I with think, the young bucks. Leads are bad. I think, you know, ball and dirt is bad. I think, you know, scoring from second, there's so many times that I see base hits now, Phil, and guys are getting hosed when they just way wide turn or not deep enough or things like that. Um, I think that's, that's the thing I probably see the most of. Um, 
I think they get a little bit lazy with some pre-pitch, you know, I, I, youth baseball, here's your round. My son's 13. He plays, you know, nonstop. It feels like, and we try to give them some breaks at times, but they play so much that they get a little bit numb to, to all of it. You know, uh, you know, it used to be for us, it was like you played in a big tournament once a month and you wanted to play really well. So good and bad, there's a lot of pressure and you were very disappointed. Well, now I think many guys get numb to a losing B, you know, I was over four. So what I have two more games tomorrow and, and that mentality, but um, I think base running is probably the biggest one that I see that's tough to tough to swallow. We get the cones out with them. I mean, the, yeah. the six year olds, the twelve year olds, we're we we have the cones out. So we we work on question mark turns, ground ball base hit, right. work on ball in the air. We work second to, to home, first to third. Yeah. We set the cones up just so they awesome. can can get their angles. Not any different yeah. than what we were doing with the college guys when we first got them. But there's just they need visuals. Yeah, you know, they, no they just they, those visuals help a lot. Yeah, I see too. Like I, I can't stand. I call it the travel ball, like pregame stuff, where it's eight guys in a line, eight guys in the outfield, and you're hitting one to the outfield, and the outfielder's throwing it to the infield, and the infield's throwing it in. Like I just, I, I don't, I, I can't stand that. I think there's a lot of wasting time. Like you can go out in the outfield and set up a mini infield and have a third base and throw it across and do some double plays and partner short hop drills, ball. all of it. Yeah. You know, glove off work. You know, it's almost like it. If you're doing it right, it's almost like an outfielder infield indie defense time yeah. where you can yeah. you can bang something out in 30 minutes that they get a lot of yeah. reps in a short amount of time. No doubt, no doubt. Instead of six ground balls or six fly balls, and yeah, for sure, that's uh, that was the big ones. What are some final thoughts? Nothing, man. I uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I appreciate you uh, asking me to be on, and and uh, I love doing the clinic the other. You know, I was a little, a little bit nervous. I'd never done like an on-field thing, and you crushed uh, it. We haven't released uh, it's, it's, it yet, so I'm excited for that to come out. We've been kind of saving some of the back end ones for here this summer, so I'm excited for everybody to see that because everybody kind of has their own take on that. But I thought, I thought just you guys, the structure of it was phenomenal, but the verbal communication for guys and just a lot of, of verbal reinforcement when guys yeah. are doing things right, I thought it was just phenomenal. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, all all stuff that's taken from other people. That's the best part about baseball, you know, going to all the clinics and doing that. It's it's uh, it's pretty neat. It's a great I, and it's rare. I don't think it happens in any other sports. You know, yeah. guys try to hide stuff. A lot of times, my assistants will be like, "Dude, what? Don't be telling them all this <laughs> stuff." You know? I'm like, "Well, I got it from somebody too." Like, it's, hopefully, they didn't watch it. <laughs> I've said it multiple times. It's like a chef. A chef yeah. could give you all the ingredients for their food. It doesn't mean you're going to cook the food the way that the chef cooks the food. Yeah, for sure. Deal. Well, Maddie, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for being yeah. on with me. No problem, man. Thank you.